The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Terry, are we live now? Yes, we are. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Let's uh, just give another uh, two minutes because we have other folks that are just joining. So bear with us for a minute. Um, we have a good group of speakers and everyone um, who is joining us for this webinar is on mute. So as you go through um, the hour, if you have a question, for any of our panelists, please um, please write it down in um, in the chat box of the webinar, and we will get to questions. But let's just wait another another minute or two. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for taking um, the time um, out of your busy uh, Tuesday afternoon. Hope everyone is having a great week. And um, countdown for um, our first robotics competition season. I am Erin uh, McCallum with Washington First Robotics. And um, we are pleased um, to have uh, several members of our team's um, Shockwave FRC team number 4488 from Aviation High School, Skunk Works, or excuse me, Shockwave from from um, uh, Oregon. I apologize, Shockwave. Skunk Works um, from Aviation High School FRC team 1983, and Talon from Limburg High School team 3588. Uh, joining us. Um, we have several um, students um, representing. So I'm going to I'm going to kick it off with a with a quick um, little bit of an overview and then um, pass the baton to um, the students who have really done an excellent job in wanting to share their best practices. So just real quickly before we begin, if any of you do have questions, please um, make note and type them in the chat um, box and we will respond to the questions as they come available. We are hoping to wrap this uh, webinar up at about 415, 420 so that we are able to um, at, um, answer questions. And then this, this webinar is recorded so that you um, have an opportunity to, uh, to reference it as you start going forward. So um, first, why is fundraising important? We all know this and certainly for teams that have had um, a season or two under their belt and they get the, the taste of travel and victory. Um, the first robotics competition is an amazing program, but there is some cost, right? There is a cost to build the robot for, our tra for your travel and competitions. And to have enough of the resources for the students on your team really um, builds sustainability uh, for, your, uh, for your team. Fundraising also helps build credibility and success for your team. There are um, some amazing nonprofit organizations across Oregon and Washington and throughout the Pacific Northwest. Uh, First Robotics is one of many. And by us working um, cohesively together, it builds some credibility and success for the team. Money encourages more, more funders to come to the table. 
Um, believe it or not, when you are asking for funds to support your team, um, the individuals, the companies, the foundations, even members of the state legislature really believe in the vision of, um, and they believe in you, you as the students, in what you are learning on your first robotics competition team, and the skills that you are gaining um, to carry forward in your, in your life after, after um, high school. The number of contributors certainly builds momentum, and it is a great opportunity for your team to really co-brand with other teams across, across the state. We are uh, very fortunate to have the Pacific Northwest District in which Oregon first robotics competition teams compete in along with Washington first robotics teams. And this year we're pleased that the, um, the Alaska FRC team is also going to be participating in the FRC district. So next slide, Terry. Okay, so just a quick overview. An average FRC team budget may look something like this. Um, we have been, um, thanks to all of your help, collecting um, each um, team's budget for the, for the season. And I know teams have done a really nice job um, over the last year in um, beginning to document what their budget looks like. And it's not just up in um, a couple of people's heads. And a budget <clears throat> is a platform that, that puts dollar numbers to your goals and objectives of your team. We have teams across um, the Pacific Northwest District that really operate on a budget of about $10,000. And then we have teams that operate on a budget of over $100,000. But as you can see, an average budget just to compete in two districts um, is about $17,000. And then as you advance and go forward, there are additional funding costs primarily to, um, as you advance to the Pacific Northwest uh, Championship and then if you go to the World Championships in St. Louis. A lot of it is based on travel and we want to work with you thoughtfully and proactively in making sure that your, but your team's budget goals are met so that you can be um, successful. Next slide. So the key to the success, just like in anything, and I know so many teams are really fantastic at building a robot, but I would imagine in your anticipation of the six-week build season, you actually develop a, a plan and you delegate tasks and you put in timelines and benchmarks and milestones. Fundraising is no different. You want to document and develop a written fundraising plan that becomes a working plan. It does not just sit on your shelf. And you want to identify and encourage everyone across your team to be involved in this. And you will hear certainly from the students that are presenting from our routines today. It really becomes a culture and an attitude and a community within your team where all students are involved in some aspect of building community and building the success of your fundraising. Research across um, the community and understanding how people give and why they would give to, um, to your team is important. Developing a very concise and succinct message, oftentimes it's referred to as your elevator speech, about who your team is, you are part of a larger community, and um, the values and, and um, things that you learn by being part of that team. Certainly fundraising takes discipline, and um, you dedicate time, and, you, and you, work, you work this very thoughtfully. Next slide. Most importantly is the right attitude. Fundraising is not about asking for you personally or even necessarily asking about your team. People, if they are willing to um, listen and are curious about 
first, which they clearly are. Um, the robot oftentimes is a is a topic that draws people to start asking questions, but they want you to succeed, and they really believe in in the good work that that your team is doing and the things that you are learning and the skills that you are that that you are acquiring. Um, they believe in you, and it the fact of the matter is if they are willing to give you the time to hear from you, they are more than willing to uh, want to help you succeed. So next slide. The kind of my my wrap um, of my slide before I pass the baton to our students is um, team discipline matters um, in fundraising. When I first joined the first organization, a lot of teams thought that fundraising could be done in a couple of months leading up to the competition. And I think a lot of our teams, um, their success rate was um, varied significantly. Uh, fundraising is about relationships and building those relationships and friendships with, the, with uh, people around the community that want you to succeed. So the more time you put into this effort, the more success you will have. And here is just a simple little arithmetic. If you were to, if your team were to make um, 15 calls an hour, an hour, telephone calls or, or 15 face-to-face -face meetings and you make seven connections of those, and seven of those connections, four of them say, yes, I want to contribute to your team. And say you are asking each of those four contributors for $400, or excuse me, $100 a person, that's $400 an hour. And if you do this three hours a day, it's $1,200 a day. And if you do it three times a week, you see how all of a sudden it becomes to $3,600 a week. Now, I know that a lot of teams um, don't organize yourselves in this fashion, but I also know that teams, when they are in um, a crunch mode, such as um, they've made it to the Pacific Northwest Championship or they've made it to the World Championship, and they literally only have a week or 10 days to raise funds, it's amazing if you, if you take some of these tips and, and implement them in your team, how quickly and effectively you, um, you fundraise. So um, next slide, please. Great, so I want to introduce um, uh, Giovanna, Kaylee, and, uh, Kylie, and Michaela from Limburg Robotics, who are going to share some best practices that um, this team has learned over the last few years. Ladies. Hi, I'm Kaylee Piggott. This is my fourth year on the team, and I'm the project manager. Hi, I'm Michaela, and this is also my fourth year on the team, and I'm the PR lead. And hi, I'm Giovanna Saravia, and this is my second year on the team, and I am one of the PR leads. So first, I'm going to be talking to you about how we go out into the community. And by physically, physically going out into the community, we take the first step to get support and sponsorships. So examples of this is that our team goes to public events such as fairs and science fairs to present our robot. For example, the pictures below are of this summer's Wrench and River Days, and by doing this, we meet potential mentors and sponsors and people who might want to be involved in first. We we'll also present at local foundations and at local businesses and companies. Like we went to McLendon Hardware and we presented our sponsorship presentation to hopefully get their sponsor, and we did. Uh, this creates personal relationships with potential sponsors and people from our community. Also, we um, local companies and business businesses are more likely to help your team than a company based across the country by going out to the community. Uh, and by going to local businesses and companies, you they feel a relationship relation to you or connection to you. So we uh, or we organize with we communicate with community foundations such as Rotary, Friends of Renton Schools, Chamber of Commerce and Kiwanis Club since they are of the Renton community too and they feel a connection to us. Next slide. Next slide. 
The next slide is go with who you know. And by this we mean you want to ask for potential sponsorships from people that you already have a relation with or connections with. So all of these are our are, are last year's sponsors. And as you can see, we wrote on the bottom the connections they have to the people on this team or to us. So for example, Dudley Smiles was a team member's orthodontist, and she asked them for a sponsorship, and they gave it to us. And Mrs. Greiner was one of the substitutes at LHS. And by going with who you know, they already feel a connection to you, and you already know them, so it's a little easier to ask for a sponsorship. And potential people you could ask could be your parents, your uncles, anyone in your family, or your doctors because they're already, they might be part of the business if it's your family members or doctors, they might have a good business and they could donate your money to your team. Next slide, please. And the next slide is that you want to bring them in. So we give, to, to advance their relationships with potential sponsors and community supporters, we invite them to our team events such as um, we give a, a, to PDRs and CDRs, so we invite them to our preliminary design review and critical design review to show them what we've been working on and to receive their feedback. We also give them a tour of our workplace during fall workshops or anything during the build season. And oddly enough, every company who has ever come to our shop has sponsored us in some way, so this is an effective way of getting new sponsors. We also invite them to a community dinner. And this is actually our first year doing a community dinner. And unlike other teams where they do spaghetti feast, instead we're going to, our team is going to do a potluck style dinner where we bring in the food and our community comes in and we share it with them. And the main focus isn't on getting more money, but instead it's on spreading the message of first. So the main people who are coming to this are the people of Renton River, the people who went to River, Renton River Days and we got their email. So I invited them, and since we didn't have enough time to explain to them what FIRST was and how to get them involved, this is um, how we're going to get them involved. Next slide. Next slide. So the key part about asking for money is that you need to ask with confidence. The best way to be able to do this is to do your research and know about the company you're asking. So for example, when you're asking a business, you need to know how big they are and how well known they are so that you know how much money would be a reasonable amount for them to donate. This also gives a guideline of what donation amount would be beneficial to your team. When you ask for money, you need to ask for specific amounts. This gives them a reasonable amount, that, or a more reasonable amount than just throwing out a standard number for all your potential sponsors. It's also important that you tell them your goals so that they have an idea of what their donation is going towards. This is important so that they can see your passion and are more likely to donate to your cause. If you show them why you really love this organization and how it has affected you, they'll see that personal connection and feel like their money is really going towards something. If you find out that they can't actually donate the money though, and if it's appropriate, you should ask them for materials, internships, and, or volunteer of their time. Um, we've actually had a sponsor say that they couldn't give us any money, but they gave us internships, like summer internships, and um, that was a that was huge. That was really huge to our team because um, for our graduating se seniors, they actually got an experience within a workplace. So that was really cool. Next slide. Uh, it's also really important that you are connected with your uh, supporters and community. So you should show them what you do, and uh, that way they can see exactly what they are supporting. So some ways that you can do this is through YouTube, emails, Twitter, blogs, and Facebook. So specifically, our team has a media team where we do weekly updates during build season, and this uh, allows our um, supporters to see our robot from the drafts all the way up to it being built and going to competition. Uh, we also do emails, which is where we invite our um, sponsors to events, such as our preliminary design review and critical design review. Uh, we use Twitter as short, frequent updates about what our team has been doing, and we specifically use Twitter for um, during competitions so that our sponsors can see how we are doing in our matches or how the entire event went. Um, we also use blogs, but unlike the unlike tweets, these are more in-depth posts. So we'll do these as kind of like a recap of competition or um, a recap of the season. And then we use Facebook to 
get our community involved with our events so that if they want to see a demonstration of a robot, they can go to one of our events. Next slide. Okay, so this is an example of a presentation that we'd give to potential sponsors. Um, next slide, please. So you really want to show the sponsors what you as a team give to the students who participate. You want to show them that you offer them a, bride, a broad set of skills that they can learn, and it's not only engineering skills. Like students learn not only CAD and fabrication, but they also can learn media and time management, organization, and public speaking. And you just really want to make the sponsors want to help your team. Next slide, please. And you also want to tell them what we want. So we show them our team's priorities, and we also give them specifics. And we tell them how we plan to meet these goals. Like we say that we want to fundraise around 45000 Our goal this year, I think, is 25000 and we let them know that we want to reach this goal by going through sponsors. Next slide. And on this slide, we give them an estimate of how their money is used throughout the year. And by kind of breaking down the $20,000, it kind of gives them a realistic expectation of what their money is used for. It doesn't seem like an inapproachable number. And this is how much we spend as a team throughout the regular build season with two district events and the championship. Um, I know it's different for every team, but this is just our rough estimate. Next slide, please. And we also show them how much it would cost if we were to go to Worlds. This is a lot more money, and the $20,000 is what it costs for our team with our travel expenses. Our team has grown significantly over the past year, so that was estimating with about 90 students, maybe 60. So it's different for every single team. Next slide, please. And then we tell them what we want from them. We give them a list of all the contribution options, showing that there are other ways to donate than just money. Um, depending on the company, you should also specifically ask for what you want from them. Like if you are talking to a major manufacturing company, you can ask for some of the materials that they use, or you can ask for mentors or internships from a big engineering firm, or big businesses for a specific negotiable amount of money. And just kind of show them that there are a ton of ways that they can support your team. Next slide. A great thing to tell the companies is what their benefits are for supporting your team because once they once you give them the example of like why you want the money and everything, they're probably wondering how does this benefit me? So it's a great advertisement for them to be shown as supporters of STEM education. Um, also their businesses are shown at, or are advertised at competitions, local schools, community events um, that your team goes to. So it's great advertisement. And um, so our team has chosen to break down the sponsored rewards on a matrix. Next slide. Uh, this is how we've chosen to break down our matrix. Um, we make sure that any sponsor gets a thank you card for um, and their name and logo on our team website. Then the more money that they donate, the more rewards their company gets. So for example, at the top, um, at 2500 or more, the big thing that we give is a robot demonstration, and our sponsors really enjoy this one. And we've uh, done a couple of these already. So it's pretty cool that our sponsors get excited to have, or to, for us to bring our robot to their companies to show it off to their employees. So we really like to do that. Next slide. Lastly, the most important thing for you to do is say thank you. And there are two main times that our team does this. One is right after they say that you're going to do a donation. And we usually send out thank you emails the day after um, we've talked to them about the donation. And then the other time is at the end of the season. 
and you want to make sure that all of your sponsors are getting this thank you for being a supporter. And we found that there's no better way than having than giving them something personal. So for us, we really like to give handmade handmade hand side cards cards from the whole team, um, as you can see as one of our pictures on the right. Um, then for our bigger sponsors, we give larger thank yous, such as social media posts about them saying thank you, and foam core boards with our team picture on it. And this one we actually present to them at their company. And the example of that is on the lower left. Next slide. Okay, Skunk uh, Works. Is... Hi, my name is Caden. My name is Ian. And we are Skunk Works Robotics Team 1983. Um, and fundraising is, is a really big part of what we do as a team. And we know that's the same for every other uh, first team out there. But there's three really key main things that we do when we're fundraising. The first one is our business outreach um, and that's where we go to the businesses um, we, we make a pitch to them we really show them our passion um, and it, it's that in-person presentation to businesses that are in our area the letter writing campaign is an event where we send out um, letters to smaller businesses around us such as our orthodontist or our dentist or or some business that we have a, a small connection to um, that were, <clears throat> and that's sending a letter to them asking for money. And then there's the spaghetti dinner, which is our annual event that we host at our school where we bring in all of our uh, parents and friends um, and we give them a chance to support our robotics team with a, a great dinner. It's a fun time. And then we have a dessert auction afterwards. And the really key thing about all three of these events that um, help us to be successful in our fundraising is that students, every student on the team is involved with each of those three events that we do. Um, it really helps to make it personal because they're the ones using the funds in, in the end. Um, and so getting them involved is a great way to make that process easier on than just having one person doing the fundraising or a small team. Um, and uh, it, it, again, it makes it more personal for them. It helps them have a, a greater stake in this robotics team that we're a part of. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So the business outreach program is my personal favorite way that we, we get to interact with our community. And the, the main point here is that it's about building relationships with businesses that are in the community. Um, and so there are companies that are local. You research your company, you find and establish your contact in the company. A really big part about this is that when you're trying to raise funds, going and cold calling somebody or asking somebody that you don't know, it's, it's really hard to be successful because businesses are out there to make money. And if they gave money to everyone who asked for it, then they'd be out of business. But um, FIRST is an awesome program and it really is deserving of that funding and their support. And the reason that they give isn't because they just want to give to anyone who gives who asks them for money, but instead it's because they can see the students' passion for the, this program and really how effective FIRST is. Um, it's great at helping kids pursue their passion and learn life skills in a context that um, is, is very uh, diverse for, for high school students and also it's just very effective at what it does. Um, and so getting those, showing that passion is a key part of how any of your fundraising efforts are going to be successful. Um, and a more important part about that is that the getting in the door is most easily done through having a actual contact in the company that you had previously. So cold calling is hard, um, but if you have a dad or a, a, a mom or someone who knows somebody in the, in the company or works there themselves, and you get that foot in the door, it makes things a thousand times easier down the road. 
Um, you start the contact through an email. You plan an in-person meeting. And the in-person part is, again, it's very important for you sharing your passion because these businesses, they see students as their next step of the workforce. Um, when they, they get old, we're going to fill their place. And so their investment is actually an investment in the future of their company. And so not only is it helping us pursue our passion and learn these key skills that are going to make us better in uh, life and, and have opportunities in college and ultimately be more effective in the workforce, but again, it's, it's so these, these companies that are supporting us, they see the students that are learning all these key skills in robotics in high school, and they say, I want that person to work for me in a couple of years. And so finding that, that those ways to support uh, robotics teams really is, is an effective way for them um, down the road. And then while you're giving the presentation, you want to talk about who you are as a team, um, what FIRST is if they don't have any other um, information about it. And then make the ask in the presentation. Definitely got to ask for money. Um, and as previous teams have talked about, it's a definite amount sometimes helps. Um, and then again, afterwards, you just got to follow up with them so that it doesn't go stagnant. If they say, we'd love to support you, make sure you get their business card, get their email, give them all of your supplies, um, and, and follow up with that and, and get that deal closed quickly after you make the presentation. And then debrief. Uh, stick back with your team. And, and again, that written plan, really learn from what you did in that presentation. So the letter, next slide, please. The letter writing campaign is one of our most exciting campaigns. So this is, this is a big part of our team's fundraising efforts, and we work really hard to get all these letters out to people, and it ends up supporting us very, very well. So this is all about getting your community involved. You have doctors, dentists, optometrists, family, friends, all these people in your community that are excited about what you are excited about. They're excited for your passion. So while they, they might not personally understand the importance of robotics or what you do, they understand that you care about this and you're passionate about it. And that's something that you can leverage and get them excited about too. So the letter writing campaign is a great way to engage these people. And it all starts by finding anyone in your network, finding people here in your parents' network, um, your mentor's network, and write them letters. Writing them a personal letter is something that many people don't get today. We all get tons of snail mail or um, spam of Fridays. But um, a hand-addressed letter is, is a rarity. So tell them a little bit about tell them a little bit about yourself, your passion, how much robotics means to you, and then include an ask. So it's really important that you do this as a uniform as a uniform message, as a unified message. If you have everyone on your team write letters at the same time as part of the same a similar program, you'll get the same materials out there, the same message. It'll also make your branding more unified across your communications with your with your community. This is really important because sometimes people get a little bit a little bit confused, um, and it makes taking in money and keeping track of everyone you've sent mail to a little bit more hectic. So once you send out that that contact, that those materials and fundraising information, um, then it's time to kind of keep in touch. So whether that's giving them a phone call, sending them an email, visiting visiting them face to face, it's important that you stay in touch. That way they know that you're a person on the other end and that you're, you're excited about it. It's also a great way to make sure they got your mail in case they somehow got lost or they had forgotten about it. Um, and finally, you really want to send a thank you note. It's important to end well and keep them, keep them on for next year. Making programs like this sustainable is what will make your team funded in the long run, which is what really matters in the end. Next slide, please. The Spaghetti Dinner is my personal favorite event. This is one of our biggest events. It brings in about, um, 20 grand each year. We just held ours last Friday night. So super exciting. Um, but this is a big event. It takes a lot of work to plan, and there's a number of things that go into this. It really is a spaghetti dinner and dessert auction. But it all starts months in advance with some parent volunteers, hopefully some mentors and even some students who can help you plan the event. Um, planning involves everything from making sure you're getting food there, um, auction items, a venue, um, to making sure that people are, are able to come and help volunteer. Um, the next stage is getting those getting those donations. So there's plenty of food that you need. You'll need spaghetti, meatballs, or even if you do something other than a spaghetti dinner, you can do salmon, 
Um, there's all kinds of different different things you can do, but you need to get that food well in advance, or at least find out who's willing to give it to you in advance. The auction items also take a while to plan. We do a dessert auction at the end and a silent auction before we begin. So what we like to do is get find local bakers, local restaurants, even parents who are willing to bake us desserts, cakes, cookies, cupcakes, and more, um, so that we can have a fun and successful, um, well-funded auction. Um, once that food is all all been gathered, then it's time to start selling your tickets. And you need people to come, and this is a great way to engage people in your community. Um, bring everyone together, bringing your entire community together for a meal is something that's, that's truly special and perhaps innately human. Um, we're, we're, we really just love sitting down and telling people about how passionate we are for robotics. And that's what the event is about. Bring people from your community in together to see your passion for robots, and the event should facilitate that. Next, you need to at the auction and dinner area. This is a little bit tricky and it requires some planning. We happen to have a great cafeteria we like to hold it in, um, in a kind of an audience or auditorium where we can have this, where we can have the auction. But um, this requires a great deal of setup. You got to get the cutlery there and um, figure out what what kind of flow you have, making sure that you can get food from from your buffet or from where you're cooking the dinner to the to the people in the in the seats, and then make sure that they can all then get to the auction. Um, it's a little bit complicated and it takes a while to plan, but it will work out in the end. Now it's time for the big night. So once the once you get there, um, you need to arrive well in advance so you can get people setting up the tables, getting cutlery out, getting food prepared, um, setting out silent auction items, all kinds of fun stuff that goes into the preparation. We like to do our ours in three stages: the silent auction, which is about half an hour before the dinner. That's when people will start to show up. They'll bid on silent auction items. They'll get their bidder card. Um, perhaps talk to, to their family or friends who are also coming and interact with other members of the community. Next is the dinner. So we'll have the dinner in two different ways. You have the option of purchasing a VIP table or getting a regular table where you'll go through the buffet. But either way, people get to interact and talk about robotics at your event. Once the dinner is done, people are starting to clean up. It's time to kind of herd your audience over into the auction area, uh, over to the auction area where you um, or you'll have someone who's, who's willing to be an auctioneer, sell off your desserts, sell off whatever you're, whatever you're auctioning off that night. We do, a, we do a range of things, so we'll auction off not only things like our, our cakes that we've been baking, but um, also things like coupons for, for yard work. So we happen to have a bunch of teenagers on our team who we can auction off for work. We sell all kinds of fun little novelty items like that, gear, um, more fun stuff. That's the real fundraising portion of the event. Selling tickets to the community is a big part of just paying for the dinner itself, but the auction is where you'll really make your money. Um, now it's time for the checkout and cleanup. This is important too, um, making sure that you ever have everyone pay, um, get all their money in, and get their auction items. Now all three of these events are important. We have everyone come to all of them, um, all our students, and it ends up really helping out our team. Our team has a budget of about a hundred, um, excuse me, we have a budget of around a hundred thousand dollars. And that's, that's relatively large, and that's largely because we have a pretty good sized team. So this year we've got something like 46 students, perhaps a little, a little bit less, a little bit more. But um, the spaghetti dinner typically nets around 20 grand. Um, and then we'll, we also do a different auction with our, with our PTSA that brings in another eight. Um, business outreach is very important. It brings in about a quarter of our budget. And finally, um, the letter writing campaign brings in, brings in about 30 grand. Each of these areas is is very important to us, and those are all big dollar amounts. So whether you're in a big city or whether you're in a small, small town in the countryside, you can make you can make money and you can fundraise using these methods. And even if you're in, a, in the tiniest town, you can still make five grand off of spaghetti dinner or money off of these letter writing campaigns. It's just the execution is takes some time and effort to prepare. So any way you do this. We wish you luck and have fun. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, Shockwave. Hello, my name is Bronwyn Grover. I am a part of Shockwave 4488. This is my second year on the team and I am a part of business. 
So a lot of times before you can start fundraising, going to your community asking for you know, donations and trying to build relationships with potential sponsors, you need to create awareness about who you are as a team. And this is basically where you go to events, whether these are events your community is holding themselves or events you are holding for your community. This way uh, people get an idea of who you are, where you're located, and what, what you do and why you need the money. Ways we do this is through civic events, community celebrations. Some examples of things Shockwave has participated in is the City of Hillsborough Outdoor Town Hall, School District Downtown Celebration Event, Fourth of July Parade, Saturday and Tuesday Markets, as well as a City Council Meeting. Now to elaborate a little bit more on some of these events, our Fourth of July Parade is one of our biggest events that our community holds that we participate in. Now the reason I say this is because such a large population uh, such a large amount of people from our community come to this. It's a fun event. You get to see us as we're walking by. We hand out stickers, a little bit of information about us, and it helps to generate that type of interest. People look more into who we are. They see what we do, and they kind of think, oh, that's really cool. I'd like to give money to that. And now their way is at the Saturday and Tuesday markets. Again, a lot of our community does attend stuff like this. Though these events do seem small, you have to remember a lot of important people attend this, and this is just either children who later tell their parents, um, parents who talk to their companies, so on and so forth. Next slide, please. Um, as you can see, these events, the D camps, school demos, social media, and media kit are more so the things that Shockwave does themselves to create this interest. Now our day camp is something new that we have um, invested in and this is a week long day camp typically held for elementary students. And we actually were able to hold this this year with one of our local sponsors. And most of these children, because they were attending a robotics themed camp, went on to tell their parents, a lot of these parents working at companies such as Intel and the type of things we get out of this may not necessarily be money, but uh, internships, potential mentors, as well as other materials. Something else is our school demo. We typically tend to do this every year towards the end of the school year. This helps us to not only create interest for any potential students who might want to join our team, but as well as, again, the whole students talking to parents and then parents talking to other people. Another great way of spreading awareness is our social media. This is great because this, again, hits such a large amount of people. And this isn't necessarily people, and this, uh, this is good because this is, helps the people who maybe could not attend your other events or may be out of state. It gets the word across. It's easy for people to share this sort of information, and it helps you to get a little bit more fun with stuff. Lastly, the media kit. This is something that Shockwave is just now starting to kind of um, invest in. It's basically a kit of stuff that is brochures, information that we might want our potential sponsors or businesses to know, ways that they can help us, what kind of money, what amount of money we might need, so on and so forth. Next slide. Now, now that you've created this interest with people, how do you keep them engaged? Again, social media and the news media. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be you updating them every day, but stuff when we have future events coming up that they might not have known about otherwise, or how we just did it a competition. Again, great way to reach people who maybe could not attend your events, or it helps to kind of spread it, not necessarily across the country, but from maybe from family members to other family members, and you get more people. Artisor, this is a very fun project. We also just started this summer. What it is is we had a woman from our local art community who came to us and said, you know, I've heard about you before, and I think I have this great idea that we could both collaborate on. Long story short, it's this robotic dinosaur, and what we do is we take it around to our community and show it off. This really does help us because it shows our community that we don't just build robots. We can help them in other ways. Uh, in this situation, it would be to help bring interest to the STEAM community. And it, we, re, we have actually reached the art community as well, so this does provide us with more interest that we might not have thought about in the first place. 
Another event is our Robo Expo. This is one of our biggest fundraising events and how we get a lot more interest in donors. So what it is is a spaghetti fundraising event where we also do hold an auction. A lot of our community, family members, donors, and elective officials are invited to, at this event. We kind of show off what we do. Um, they are given the chance to see this year's robot as we do hold it typically towards the end of our build season as, and it does help to kick off the competition season. So people get to drive all around our old robots as well as see our new one. The VIPs actually help us to kind of generate interest within other people in our community as well as raise our profile. And it does help that show support for um, STEM school and our school as a whole. This event is really great because part of our auction, most of our stuff is donated to us by family members or community members, anybody basically, small businesses. And what we do is people, we, we have our mem uh, members on the team sell tickets about a couple of weeks prior to this event, and they can sell this to whoever might have an interest. This event is also open to people who kind of just want to see what we're about, and this could be people who are basically kind of wandering off the street. They pay for their ticket. They come in. They look around. They have dinner. They participate in our silent auction, as well as see other things that um, other people that, are, that we host at this event, and this is stuff such as we have FLL, FTC, FTC teams. Um, we also this year had um, a person from Intel who was a fashion designer, and what she did was create this kind of robotic dress that we were able to bring in. So again, this is a little bit more of the whole STEAM community, as well as the sheriffs brought in their robots that we were able to kind of play around with. So all in all, this is a really fun event, and it isn't necessarily just focused on our team. It's kind of how has STEM affected our community as a whole. You do get a lot of donors out of this. We typically get about, oh, I want to say maybe 1,500 every year from this event, so it does help us with a lot of cost, and it does provide a lot of interest as it is a little bit more of a fun yet intimate setting as students from our team are able to go to people that they couldn't reach before and tell them what we are about as a team. Next slide, please. So how do you accept the support? What we use is our school's nonprofit status. This way people do get money back from during the tax season. We also send out a thank you card that has the sponsors' names on it, our accomplishments that year, and a picture of our team and an official letter of recognition with the school's tax ID sent out. Another thing we do is we help we maintain an up-to-date database of donors and contacts. This way we know who currently is helping to donate us and who to go back to the next year to ask again, as you do want to ask them every single year. Next slide, please. So after the give, so after they've given money to you, what do you do to help them out? So again, they, most of our donors and sponsors are invited to team events as pra and practices. Something we do is we actually invite some of them to our workshop and give them a tour around. This is really fun because they get to see where kind of their money is going and they get to see us during our most act active part of the comp uh, season. And another types of events that this includes is our Robo Expo as well as competitions themselves. We do include a team picture, photo complete with the donor's name and team accomplishments. We visit the businesses themselves to show off their offer robot and give thanks. This is also a really great time for the people working at that business to drive around the robot themselves. We hold kind of a little intimate special friend, um, special friend slash team dinner, and we hold this at the end of the year. We say thank you to them, let them know how much this has meant to us, as well as kind of unofficially invite them back for next year. Another important thing that we do is a bi-monthly newsletter to donors. And what this is, is about two times a month, sometimes more, is during our competition season, we let them know what it is currently each subgroup is doing. This way we create interest with them on how they know what exactly we are doing 
as well as it is a little bit more fun because it's a little bit more of a personal touch to this whole don donator slash team relationship. Next slide. Great. So um, thank you very much, um, team members. Really appreciate you sharing um, sharing some insights. So um, we're wrapping up, and we certainly have time for questions. But this slide just basically um, kind of summarizes everything that the three teams um, have shared with you today. And bottom line is, you know, don't make fundraising the last thing you do. Make it the first. Um, competition season is January through April, and just so you recognize, um, a lot of funders, whether they are corporate or individuals, make their decisions about what charities and what organizations to support. They have a tendency to be thinking about that in um, the first, second, and third quarters of the year. And by the time your team is getting ramping up in October, November, December, in preparation for competition season, a lot of companies and individuals, as, as impressed they are with your team, they may have already allocated their funding. So think about fundraising really as a 12-month process that it doesn't need to be as intense as your six-week build period, but make it and ingrain it as part of your overall culture of your team and recognize and celebrate um, those, those milestones. Certainly do your homework. You heard from um, all three of the teams. It's important to do your research and um, ask for a specific amount. If you are uncomfortable in asking for a specific amount, my suggestion is, and when I work with a lot of teams, is, is um, give a range. Give a range so that um, the individual or the company knows um, what the expectation is um, and where, where their company or where their individual gift would fit nicely into um, allowing your team fit your overall, um, your overall budget. You never can say thank you enough. Um, we are learning about some additional tips and creative ways to say thank you and happy to share those ideas and best practices out to the teams in our upcoming communication. Certainly keep a running total and celebrate those milestones. I know all teams, um, you, you work really really hard in fundraising and sometimes it seems like they never come through and then all of a sudden when you kind of take a deep breath then all of a sudden you'll you'll hear from a funder and they they've made a commitment to contribute to your team or they've made a commitment to provide three internships over the summer or provide um, a couple more mentors for your team celebrate those milestones because um, building those relationships take time and um, and keep working on it. And kind of the last final is, um, you know, train everyone in your in your team to be fundraisers. I was doing a, a, a webinar or a seminar with First Tech Challenge a couple weeks ago, and I had two students who participated in it, and I asked them what what the team's budget was, and they said to me we don't know we're on the build team. And I said, that is the wrong answer, my friends. You need to know um, what your budget is. You don't necessarily need to know all the details. But you never know who potentially could give, give you money. And each and every one of you are um, your number one ambassador for the team. So I um, want to wrap up. Uh, Terry, make uh, the last slide available in terms of um, this is how you um, follow up with any of any of our teams, um, Shockwave and um, Skunk Works and Talon. If you have any questions, if you are interested in receiving ideas or plans, uh, you know, a sample fundraising letter, a sample event plan on the on the um, spaghetti dinner or some sort of a of an auction, feel free to email them. 
We also have templates um, here at Washington First Robotics that we are happy to share. We've learned um, over, the, over the years that um, what works for one team often will work for another team. Um, and we're happy to, to um, be your partners in, in um, developing a plan that actually works for your team. So, um, Terry, are there any questions that um, teams have, have asked during, the, during this session? Erin, we don't have any questions. This is Adrian. We've got Justin Allen with his hand up, so I'm going to unmute Justin. Okay. Um, and then he can ask his question. Justin, you should be unmuted. Oh, it looks like you're self-muted as well. So, Justin, you can try and unmute yourself. Oh, uh, I have a question. Uh, for for uh, Shockwave, uh, they talked about how they offered levels of uh, fundraising, but uh, then you guys pointed out that you wanted to um, uh, you guys wanted to um, you know ask for a specific amount of money, but they said also that you should have certain fundraising levels. Did you get my question? So, in terms of the fundraising levels, what I what I meant by that is more so how much the donor is giving us, and this is typically goes by the thousand, so one thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand. Uh, does that help? Yes, that helps. And then we have another question um, to all three teams. Which companies are your biggest sponsors? <laughs> so for Shockwave, <clears throat> LAM Research and Intel typically tends to be our biggest sponsor. Aviation, do you uh, guys have Yeah, um, yeah at, at Skunk Works, we're... Aviation High School, um, and so we're really close with Boeing. We're actually right across the street from them, and they've been one of our biggest sponsors. Absolutely. We also do a number of grants um, to a couple other companies that are able to support us as well. Um, but Boeing's are really is our, definitely our biggest sponsor. And a couple others would be OMAX with their water jets, and then uh, Lockheed Martin's big too. Alaska Airlines too. Alaska Airlines, yeah. Okay, Lindbergh, what about you guys? Yeah, for, for Lindbergh High School, uh, Precore uh, Incorporated up in Woodenville is, uh, was our largest sponsor last year, and then Red Dot in Tukwila has been a, a large sponsor both of materials and, uh, materials and funds and internships for the past five years for us. Wonderful. Erin, right now we don't have any more questions. Okay. Great. Well, thanks everyone for participating. Um, this webinar will uh, be posted on um, uh, firstwa.org probably within the next 24 hours, so feel free to use it as a reference point. We have several upcoming um, FRC workshops and training sessions, so please check our calendar um, for upcoming um, upcoming events and and take advantage of those um, opportunities, we have a we have a large number of rookie teams for FRC uh, participating this year, both from Oregon and Alaska. So we're super excited about about them. Um, for those veterans, feel free to um, adopt one of those rookie teams and and help them not only come build season, but but um, catch them up to speed on all of this other fantastic stuff that you have learned um, how to do over the years. And um, thanks so much, um, everyone, for taking the time. The final leadership series um, webinar series is going to be held on Tuesday, November 17th, and we will be sending out that topic. Um, in the next week. So thanks so much, everyone, and have a great um, afternoon and evening. Thanks, panelists.